It's the Second World War. Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia were at opposite ends, fighting for the Baltic Sea territory. The German U-boat U-479 was operational in the Baltic Sea and is rumoured to have been on a secret mission. Would it be possible to find the lost boat? Hunt for U-479. But it's not only wars that create shipwrecks. Baltic Sea is a hazardous sea, with extreme weather and shallow waters, thousands of islands and rocky shores, and harsh winters when thick ice covers the northern coastlines. The environmental conditions are also unique. The water is cold and the saline levels too low for most marine species to survive, including corals and the shipworm, that everywhere else destroys shipwrecks in no time at all. Baltic Sea is filled with well-preserved wrecks. It's a treasure trove for any diver or archaeologist. We are pretty much where we started at the beginning of this TV series eight months ago in Konola, suburbs of Helsinki, Finland. Back to our friend Yari's flat, making plans. On rock. There are the American underwater camera casings that we were desperately waiting for in Estonia. They finally found their way, surprise, surprise, to Finland. It's too little, too late. This is the man behind the entire Baltic Sea adventure. Him and his lost German U-boats. By now, we have too many cameras and underwater casings, but not enough divers to use them. <laughs> the Finnish archipelago sea is an unknown wonder. It's the largest archipelago in the world by the number of islands. Numerous ferry lines form the so-called archipelago ringway. Most of these ferries are free, or only charge a small fee. The exact figure for the amount of Finnish islands is anybody's guess. Estimations vary from 20,000 to 50,000, since sometimes it's a matter of opinion to tell the difference between an island and a rock. In comparison, the number of Indonesian islands range between 13,000 and 18,000. And the number of Greek islands is no more than 1,400. Even when the very word archipelago, meaning a cluster of islands, comes from Greece. We stay overnight in a guest house on the island of Nauru, where Pelagonia is moored. beautiful place, and no other guests around. In August, the Finnish holiday season is over already. Yari, who is a diver and works as an engineer for the Finnish army, has taken care of sorting out diving permits for the Swedish technical diving team. We'll meet them tomorrow on the island of Korpo. We'll be looking for the lost U-479 outside Uto Island. But we'll also find other wrecks for the Swedish team to dive in the outer archipelago. But we know the layout and there's no lack of interesting dive sites. Just nearby, the Finnish Baltic Sea holds in its bosom a true treasure. The 18th century ship, Vero Maria, is estimated to be the most valuable treasure ship in the world. Vero Maria, Lady Mary, was a standard two-masted wooden merchant ship. She was on her way from Amsterdam, Holland, to St. Petersburg, Russia, 
works of art and sculptures were on their way to nobody else but Catherine the Great of Russia. On October 1771, a month into her voyage, an autumnal storm sunk her outside the island of Yurmo in southwestern Finnish archipelago, and there she rests, neat and tidy, almost untouched, ship cargo and all. At the time, only six paintings were salvaged. Vero Maria was lost and forgotten for over 200 years, until maritime archaeologist Christen Alström became interested in her story. A famous Finnish commercial diver, Raunu Koivasari, and his crew finally found the wreck in 1999. In Finland, we met Mr. Koivasari's friends, researcher Mikael Martikainen and diver John Liljelund, who both played their part in finding Vero Maria. The Vero Maria is special in, in, in the sense that as a wreck, it's in very good condition. It's said to have carried a very uh, valuable cargo. Works of art bought by Catherine the Great from an auction in, 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 in Amsterdam. There was an international highway between St. Petersburg and, and Central Europe going through this area where it sunk. So it was just a lorry carrying a cargo, but, but the fact that what cargo it carried and what, in, in a, what a beautiful condition it is today. And it's a, still a beautiful uh, lorry. From Maria, is, I think that it's the only treasure ship in the world. Mm -hmm. that, because if you go into the Caribbean Sea or places like that, where is that kind of ships mm. and shipwrecks, there is only sand and the coins. But yeah. there is no wreck anymore. <laughs> There's no wood, no. This is a um, handwritten note uh, from the Dutch archives in Amsterdam. The most interesting, I think, and, and which proved then to be very crucial for the identification of the wreck was this inventory. Do you yes. remember this? Yes, I, I remember, because and we, we did find the anchor there. Yeah, the anchors. Yeah. In uh, web uh, anchor in the flock broken, which, which means basically that it was a, it was a warp anchor with a, a one arm missing. And that was, I think, about the first items that you found. Yes, we were the first guys to go down there. And uh, the wreck was behind. It was my, in my back. I went down to the bottom. I was about one meter above the bottom. You can see anything. Then when I turned around, I saw the whole uh, wreck. I saw the sunlight coming down from the shore and the half of the wreck was like a silhouette. Oh my God. And it was like from Donald Duck. <laughs> it was really amazing. By the way, Donald Duck is a very popular cartoon character in Scandinavia. Unsurprisingly, a dispute has been going on for years about the fate of Vero Maria. Should she be raised and salvaged? Should she remain underwater as a diving site with an archaeological interest? The heated debate continues. The Swedish technical diving team have joined us on our Baltic Sea adventure in the Finnish archipelago. Our diving boat Pelagonia was moored overnight at Korpestrom Harbour. The kind people of Korpestrom gave us permission to moor at the end of the pier. It's an ideal position for loading all the diving gear. Boy, do we have a lot of stuff. After having just spent time with the Estonian sports divers in the Hiemar waters, we are quickly reminded how many gas bottles the Trimex divers need. Alongside, yeah, yeah. And then just the soft stuff, the soft Yeah. We have some other wrecks to die. Yes, we have. Here, here is the auto map. We have a quick planning session and tell the team about the wrecks close to the Auto Island and the lost U-boat U-479. Today the divers will dive the famous wreck of Park Victory, an American cargo ship sunk in a storm outside Uto. 
Miari tells the details. Where we are staying, you know, here is Park Victory. It's uh, to the bottom 38, about. Yeah. It's quite nice looking, and, and there's, the water is very clear. Mm -hmm. So for the mm -hmm. filming purposes, you should be able to do quite nice images. Yeah. The park, mm -hmm. It's quite a big, big ship. Yes. Uh, 150 meters or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Producer Tony Radic has travelled from Tallinn, Estonia to help us with the boat in the rubber rib. He owns a couple of boats by the Baltic anyway and he's a navigator. It's good to have him on board. From Inner Archipelago, we'll be heading to the outermost year-round habited island of Finland, Uto. The Swedish name Uto means outer island in English. People have lived on these islands for thousands of years. Fishing and fish processing, shipping, trade and tourism are the main income. There are around 60,000 permanent residents scattered around the archipelago. Most of them are Swedish-speaking Finns. Since summer cabins and tourism are the ever-increasing business, the population more than doubles during the summer months. The divers have their own camera gear with them, but they get interested in the extra camera casings we bought with us. Maybe they can do something useful with them. They start putting together a scooter cam from the materials we happen to have with us on board. A big part of the archipelago belongs to the province of Orland, a Swedish-speaking autonomous and demilitarized part of Finland. This status goes way back. The archipelago is situated in a position of great strategic importance. Finns, Swedes, Russians and Germans have all had their eye on the islands during different wars. And during the Crimean War, even Anglo-French forces attacked Orland. I think it's actually a strange... Uh, a rock. Extremely strange. In 1856, it was decided that the islands should not be fortified and remain independent as a barrier between the many occupying forces. Not that no one wouldn't have tried, even after that. For years it's been forbidden to dive the wreck of Park Victory. It lies in the military zone not far from the Uto Coast Guard station. Yari, who works for the Finnish military, has organized for us diving commissions. But as soon as the divers start gearing up, we get a phone call asking if we have the paperwork in order. And of course we do, it's just a funny feeling that even out here at sea, somebody's watching us. The divers start gearing up. They're like underwater spacemen and women. So how do we get that thing? In the water, are you going to drop it off? Or? Tour has put a line on the, a black line on the outside. Yeah. We can try to just lower it down. Big American cargo ship Park Victory was anchored outside Ulta, near the islet of Lilholm. It was Christmas Eve in 1947. Park Victory was to spend the night and then continue to Helsinki. The pilot had already boarded the vessel. He was meant to guide the ship through the maze of the archipelago and the still uncleared Second World War minefields. But late that night, a storm rose. The ship started to roll and the anchor chain broke. The ship drifted to rocks, started to leak and sink. Panic ensued. When lifeboats were lowered, others who had jumped into the sea were crushed. Some managed to swim to nearby rocks to wait for rescue. The people of Uto came to help and risking their own lives managed to save 38 men. The islanders opened their homes to the survivors and they spent that Christmas on the island. 
What a Christmas it must have been. Ten men died that night. The evening sun is setting when we moor at the Uto Harbour. The divers unload the rubber rib. <laughs> Happy? <laughs> yeah. Good. Happy. It's really beautiful but all these mosquitoes. It's a picture postcard evening. Again, Yadi's army connections come to good use. We get permission to use the auto army barracks as a base camp, as long as we promise to leave it the way we find it. No extra services are on offer. We didn't quite know what to expect, but the accommodation is really good. Big, clean and comfortable. It's the last on the right is ours. We start to prepare dinner right away. Everybody's really hungry by now. Oh, you have your briefcase. <laughs> so what do you do? <laughs> you work at the Heineken. The waters outside Ultov are known as the graveyard of ships. There are many wrecks here. This beautiful summer sun can turn into fierce winter storms, and the numerous rocks make the sea difficult to navigate. <laughs> Have you got enough rope to give them so that we can back? Cross waves make getting hold of the boy really difficult, and Lady Pelagonia is tricky to manoeuvre. It takes some time and effort, and there are some hairy moments, but finally we get there. It's important not to give up. We are stuck. Yeah. And stuck usually is bad. No, this is a good way. This is good stuck. One of the gases the Trimex divers use is helium, and we all know what helium does. This is such a hardcore male thing, the diving. Only those uh, macho guys who do it. The diving team is ready to go again, and we lower the scooter cam to them. Good luck to us all. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's the old waiting game for the boat and film crew. The divers had a good dive today, and the scooter cam is still in one piece. Another successful day. Oh. Was the visibility better than yesterday? Yeah, it was actually. Yeah. Quite a lot better. Yeah, because I it kind of uh, looks like even... The, camera, the film from the scooter camera I think will be excellent. We have to check that film. Yeah. Was it a good dive? Uh, it's a really good dive. On a gorgeous day like this, it's hard to imagine 
that during winter months, the villagers are sometimes housebound for days and have to tie all their loose property down with ropes if they don't want their stuff to be blown out into the sea. The icebreakers keep the ferry connections going, and yet, the life in these island communities can become pretty grim during the autumnal storms. But that's part of the charm and makes the islanders special. You've got to be multi-skilled to survive in these conditions all year round. There are only about 30 permanent residents on Ulto, but the population is ever-changing because of holiday and summer visitors and the presence of the army and the coast guards. Do we fire? You are hungry now. Yeah. Do we hot fire up the grill upstairs and do the sausages? Yeah, well, on. Yeah. Yeah. Salad. We have a grilled lunch at Pelagonia. Food always tastes better outside. Was it okay? Really? Tor transfers the Park Victory diving footage onto hard drive so that we can all view it from the computer screen. You want to see uh, the video? Tanya? Got it. No? Video time. Do you have your ticket? Yeah, check this one. <laughs> I threw that. Wasn't that a good shot? That nice. Was yeah. It didn't even touch him. <laughs> you tried. You tried. Park Victory is a new dive site for Tor, Per and Lotta, and they were positively surprised. The American cargo ship is big, 150 meters long, and the scooters became handy. They make it a lot quicker to get from place to place and get an idea of the wreck. They were right. The scooter cam pictures are brilliant. Park Victory is quickly falling apart. First of all, it snapped in two when it sank. But since then, the deterioration has been significant. Most of the chimneys and masts have collapsed and the deck is in a bad state. These divers make an excellent underwater filming team. They have been diving together for years. They are really good at lighting the wrecks with their powerful underwater lights. This is the ship's bow. It's massive in a big ship like this and gives you an idea of the scale of the wreck. Tor is filming with the main underwater camera. Par does fine work with the lights while Lotta is the one handling the scooter cam. It's usually just Lotta and Par in the pictures since Tor is behind the camera.
It's funny how the Baltic Sea can preserve old wood. At the same time, the half-salty water still manages to destroy steel cargo ships. The place of the wreck is also important. The deeper they rest, the safer they are from the high seas, packed ice and fishing nets. The position where Park Victory lies is open to all the elements outside the outer Finnish islands. Diving wrecks is dangerous, and diving broken down wrecks even more so. There's always a possibility of getting trapped. The divers look after one another. In the first place, we are here to look for the lost German U-boat, U-479. But we hear from the Finnish diver Jussi Kassanen. He's just searched the collision site of U-boat U-479 and Russian submarine Lembit. While we are waiting for the latest conclusions about the incident, we decided to dedicate the day to the sites at Uto. That's easily done, since all the local attractions are only five minutes walk away. So what you would do? Lighthouse first and then go by here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Candy Coloured Lighthouse is a well-known landmark and it is the first and the most southern lighthouse in Finland. The original lighthouse was blown to pieces during the Swedish-Russian War in the early 19th century. This building was built soon after that, in 1814. Lighthouse Ytte, kutsuu ja we meet some enthusiastic radio amateurs. Although the outer islands are well connected to the mainland, these guys are prepared if disaster strikes. All radio amateurs out there, please contact Yeren. He is waiting for your call. Sierra Mexico 5, Sierra India Charlie, playing as well. Yes. So we try to go to where we're going? To the church. To the, church. the lighthouse church is still in use and it's a popular spot to get married, exotic and remote, and therefore romantic. Older people on the island started to complain about the stairs to the lighthouse church, so a prayer house was built. A typical coastal church feature is a model of a sailing ship, commemorating all of those lost at sea and a reminder of the men still out there. We are here because of Park Victory. There's a silver ten light candelabra to remember the ten men that drowned when the American cargo ship Park Victory sank. Framed on the wall, there's a letter from the American Embassy thanking the people of Uto for their bravery, saving the lives of the crew of Park Victory. I express to your excellence in my warm admiration for the heroic actions of the townspeople of Uta in the rescue of the crew of a sinking American vessel. Then the same townspeople took into their homes for shelter and for nourishment the survivors of the shipwreck. And it's thanking the Finnish people for their courage and seamanship. Only recently, the island of Alto also became famous for being the first rescue station for the Estonia ferry disaster. We saw the children's memorial in Estonian island of Hiuma just a while ago. We are just north from the accident site. Nice to see other people work. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best part. But we have really got into the, the filming side of things. There are divers that just dive. Yeah, we started it as an add an extra thing to the diving. Mm. Yeah. It's more like a a project that yeah. everyone has a specific task to do and yeah. when you come up and see that everything has been working it's it's great. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah and this is the hard part is that you have the guy who 
who handles the lighting, mm. and then the film, and then yeah. the models. And they all have to work together, but without communicating under the water, because you, yeah. you can't really have a discussion going on. When you're at 70 meters or mm. 60 meters, you don't have much time. No. Yeah. So every second really, really yeah. count, yeah. and have to, you have one take, that's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And then it's next time we can do the same take again. Yeah. We, learn th we learn new things every, like yeah. every time we do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Do you have a lot of problems to find divers that you can work with? I think the biggest problem is to find good enough divers yeah, yeah, yeah. who you can like count on because you don't dive to like 60, 70 meters with, with uh, anyone. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to know the people and dive uh, a couple of dives with them yeah. first to, yeah. to do an advanced dive together. Yeah. So in Sweden it's probably like maximum 20 people. Probably this Park Victor is quite good to yeah. start. Yeah, it's because it's kind of like you know yeah, you have this shallow and um, yeah, it's yeah. a starter wreck. The, the depth, yeah, yeah. The, it's a start wreck. The, yeah. the, uh, the depth is uh, is really good for for a starting wreck, but yeah. it's a pretty advanced dive because it's dark and it's, the visibility is not that good and it's, the wreck is pretty broken. And it's big, so it's quite hard to navigate. Right? Yeah. So it, it's like I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, dive with like a total uh, yeah. a new diver. Mm. And that's the other thing <laughs> with, with the, the technical dive. I mean, it's like. The boats, everything has to be thought thought of in advance, like yeah. where to put the tanks on the boat, how to get into the water, how mm. to get out of the water, especially in the deep dives, because if this would have been like deep dives we were doing, mm. we, we, could, we couldn't lift like anything for like one or two yeah. hours afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. We have to like sit down, take it calm. Mm. Have you been doing cave diving? Or? Uh, yes, Tor has. I, I have been doing cave diving, but uh, I have been diving caves in the uh, US and uh, Mexico. Yeah. The problem in Sweden, we only have uh, like one little, little, very little cave in Sweden. Yeah. That's all. Mm. In Finland, there's, I think there's supposed to be some kind of mine. Yeah, there are mines. Some good mines. Yeah. 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 Lots of techniques we learn in cave diving can be used in wreck diving as well. Yeah. yeah. When you go into the wrecks and things like that. Mm. It's, it it's not like the same environment in any way, mm. but you can adapt some of the techniques. Yeah. So I think uh, cave diving is. Uh, the education is very, very good, and cave diving is really, really fun. <laughs> you have a very weird idea of fun, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I think it does look really scary looking <laughs> In the first place, we came here to dive the nearby collision site of Russian submarine Lembit and German U-boat U-479. In 1944, the Russian submarine Lembit was on its way to Helsinki when it hit an unidentified object. Could it have hit the German U-boat U-479 that got lost in the Baltic Sea at the same time? There's been some late developments regarding the incident. Our side scan sonar expert, Finnish diver Jussi Kassanen, has just searched the collision site. There are some surprise conclusions. This puts a spanner in the works. If the location has just been searched, there is not much point in going there with the Swedish technical diving team. We'll meet Jussi Kassen and soon again in mainland Finland. He will tell us the results of his expedition. Time to make new plans. This is the last morning at the Auto Army Barracks. Film and boat crew and the Swedish diving team are all packing their gear and getting ready to leave. We were very lucky with the weather during these few days, and although our plans changed dramatically, we are still very happy with the trip. We say goodbye to the idyllic Uto. This small group has a good representation of the Northern Baltic peoples. Lotta was born in Finland, a Finnish Swede, but is now a Swedish citizen. Tora was born in Norway, but now lives in Sweden. Only Pad is originally Swedish, Tony is from Tallinn, Estonia. Yari and Kari are from Finland. Tanya and Kimo are Finns currently living in England. This summarizes the history of the Baltic Sea. People have always moved around and used the Baltic Sea as the highway. It's rated down to like, I don't know, 150 meters, something yeah, like that. Like yeah. It's like uh, 1,500 watts. Normal, normal, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's seven to eight times more effective yes. yeah. than uh, just normal. Yeah. 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 
The divers tell us about technical and commercial diving. I think the biggest risk is to breathe the wrong gas. Yeah. And if you breathe the wrong gas, you'll die. You're like showing your, you're showing your tank to the other guys, and it's like, oh, okay, this is like 21 meter gas. You check, you it check your gas. Oh, yeah. this is 21 meters. You take the hose, check it again. It's 21 meters, and then yeah. you switch the gas, and everybody's looking at you at the same time. So you, even in like 70 meter dive, 60 meter dive, if you do like a 60 meter dive for 20 minutes, it goes di directly to the surface. You will die. That's a snorkel. Yeah. All the Baltic Sea countries have influenced each other through history, in good and bad. Shall we leave your stuff down there? Shall we bring it up? Leave it. Okay. Wars have brought misery. Occupations have changed state lines, while commerce and travel have united, profited and enriched. Still, the different cultures surrounding the Baltic Sea have remained so, diverse and strong. We are back in Corpustron. When mooring, our Captain Yari loses his sea legs. Does he survive the fall? Yari blames a wobbly plank on the pier. To our relief, he lives to tell the story with only a bruised leg and a bruised ego. Everybody starts the journey back home. The diving team pack their cars, then drive to the mainland Finland and take a ferry back to Stockholm, Sweden. We say goodbye for now to our friends. The rib is packed on the trolley. Caddy and the rib go back to Helsinki. The owners of Pelagonia come to collect their boat. So this is it. It's finally all It's been good time. Kimo, Tanya, Tony and Yari spend one night at the guest house at Gorpu. We are all exhausted. Thanks for a great weekend, having a drink, trying to get tour to see karaoke, no luck, this far. We guess you would be easier to get on the stage. Smiley days. <laughs> In the morning, Tony journeys back to Estonia. <laughs>
Tanya and Kimo travel to Helsinki to find out what diver Zulsi Kastanen has found out about the alleged collision between Russian submarine Lembit and the lost German U-boat U-479. We meet Zulsi at his diving club. Okay, so you you went to check out this site. Yeah, with the site scan. Yeah, on. the site is here on the map. You can see this really deep canyon, almost or not almost, but they're hundred deep, hundred meters deep, and this canyon is going past Ut, the main island. And this location where Lembit claims that they had this collision is just on the western side of this main shipping lane coming in from the sea. How large area did you cover, by the? The what area covered was two miles wide and three miles in the south. So you went direction. over the rim of the yeah yeah we went all, all over to the side of the canyon so that we really wanted to make sure that we cover the whole whole area. And it's you have the saved file yeah we the, have the yeah. recording from the trip we made and here's the previous file from the previous track. You can see that the bottom is just like empty. There's yeah. sand, clear and rather flat sandy bottom. But here, look what we have here. Uh, here's a in the middle of really flat bottom, there's suddenly depth change. This is a rock formation, and yeah. the depth change is more than 12, 12 meters, 14 meters roughly. Yeah. And suddenly the bottom rises from 40 meters all the way to 25, 26, 28 meters. And that's something that, in theory, could be something that Lembit could have hit. End of 1944 and the Second World War, submarine Lembit reports hitting a German U-boat. In that political climate, accidentally hitting a rock would have meant bad news for the submarine captain and crew. We checked the local papers, that if it would have collided with some mm. fishing boat or something, yeah. there should be some kind of yeah. information in the in the papers yeah. at that time that if there were like, you know, four or five men lost and, and a boat lost, that yeah. should be somewhere, but there's no record. And of course, if, if they would have hit a fishing boat, yeah. the fishing boat Def would be there. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and, and so in, in that way, the coll collision with the rock formation probably is the... Yeah and the Conclusion. location of this rock formation matches rather nicely and as I said it's really flat all over the yeah around yeah, yeah. this around this area if you think about the Lembit there wouldn't be that many people who would know what happened yeah. because yeah, that's true. the crew wouldn't know it, it yeah. would be the captain and, and the guy yeah. who's using the sonar or whatever system yeah. they have there so so they could easily kind of fake yeah it. I, I believe that it is really easy to fake the whole thing and then say to the crew, but hey, this is the official story and everyone else, you guys, yeah. don't say a word. Who wants to have a long yeah. trip well, in Siberia? Who wants to go for a skiing <laughs> holiday in Siberia? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you 479 is still somewhere. It's, it's somewhere lost. on the operation area, operational area probably. Yeah, but at least we kind of sorted out one yeah. mystery of the Baltics here yeah. regarding the Lempit. Yeah, congratulations yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> Since the independence of Estonia, the British built Lembit is again an Estonian submarine and a museum boat in Tallinn. After the collision, Lembit only needed minor repairs. The German U-boat U-479 is still missing in the Baltic Sea. This is the story that got us started on the journey. The outcome is not what we expected, but it seems plausible. Tanya and Kimo start heading back home to England. 
We take the ferry from Helsinki, Finland, to Stockholm, Sweden. The vessels between Helsinki and Stockholm are more like ocean liners, full of restaurants, tax-free shops, bars and clubs, and a good night's sleep in a nice cabin. We could do with some creature comforts at this point of the journey. The trip is not over yet, and we still have a few Baltic stories to tell. In Stockholm, we meet Per Orkesson, web designer, researcher and diver. He tells us about the mystery wreck found by the Swedish Navy. It lies 100 meters deep in the Baltic Sea. The quality of the underwater footage is not very good. It was filmed with the Navy robot camera. Well, you know, in 2002, it was a sensation when the Swedish Navy found this thing. Uh, an intact 18th century ship standing with all masts on a hundred meters depth. And it's a mystery ship. Nobody knows what it is. Mm. And they filmed this. And not even the what nationality it was. Yeah. But it's also unknown. Totally unknown. Any day, a trawler fisher just might be going on this spot and disrupt it totally. Yeah, that's and because the masts are big. sticking. Oh yes. 20 meters up, so yes, yeah. that's the big risk. So, do you have any idea where it is? Have they given any kind of indication about the location, or is it just? It's is it on Swedish water? Yes. No, it's on international oh, water right. in the Baltic Sea. Yeah. But the location is kept secret by the captain, the commander of um, Belos, which is the Swedish Navy submarine rescue ship. Yeah. And um, I think the reason for that is that in here, uh, in Sweden, we have this um, law that official information must be made public unless there is a very specific decision of making uh, something classified or secret. Yeah. So uh, if the, the, this commander would have written the location in, um, in the official logbook or something oh, like right. that, there would be this risk of, of this information being public. And yeah. then they fear that some, some commercial divers or treasure hunters would, would go there before an official investigation. Yes. The figurehead is a seahorse and it's part animal, part human, it has human hands. So it's, it's really a mythological figure. We believe that it's, it has been totally gilded because in this video we see traces of gold um, gleaming. So it's a real beautiful figurehead. Yeah. The actual ship, of course, as we said, it's unknown. Uh, but it's not, it's not a big warship and it's not a, a typical merchant ship. It's, it's a small ship for some special purpose. Maybe a small military ship. Maybe a post ship. It has had cannons. Maybe six cannons. We see that on the gun ports. Yeah. It's quite rare that a totally intact ship like this mm. just yeah. sinks for no apparent reason and remains yeah. preserved. Somebody pulled the plug. Yes, maybe. <laughs> we don't know. There may have been uh, pirates taking those valuable secrets or whatever and then mm. pulling the plug. But yeah. why would they do that? The ship was valuable, so it's a mystery. Yeah. It's a dream of any diver to find a historically significant wreck or a treasure ship with a valuable cargo. Driving through Sweden and crossing over the Danish Straits to Denmark you have the option of taking yet another car ferry or the longest road and rail bridge in Europe. The Øresund Crossing, opened in the year 2000. It connects the Swedish town Malmö and the capital of Denmark, Copenhagen. The combined bridge and tunnel is 17 kilometers, about 10 miles long. The Danes are experienced bridge engineers. The whole country is made of Jutland Peninsula and a cluster of islands, and the long bridges keep them connected. When the bridge was first open, the traffic was slow and the high toll charges were blamed. Now locals get discounts and the bridge is considered a good idea. 
The people can live in Sweden and keep on working in Denmark or vice versa. The Kingdom of Denmark is a gateway, positioned between Scandinavia and the rest of Europe, and between the Northern and the Baltic Sea, a perfect place for commerce and collecting taxes from all the passing sea vessels, a great location for accumulating wealth. Copenhagen is an ancient harbour, and even in Viking times there was a fishing village here. The village grew rapidly into a busy town, it's the capital of Denmark and the home of the oldest European monarchy. Many other nations have wanted a piece of the action. The war between Swedish and Danish monarchs went on for ages. The British have knocked on its doors and the Germans occupied it during the Second World War. But Denmark has prevailed and kept its prosperity. Today it's mostly known for architecture, design, culture and beer. Numerous ferry operators connect Sweden and Denmark, having travelled the whole summer back and forth, taking many ferries crisscrossing the Baltic Sea. It brings to mind the environmental consequences. There must be a price to pay for the heavy traffic. The Baltic Sea is a very special place and said to be the largest brackish low saline level sea in the world. It has been a dumping ground for all kinds of chemicals and toxins throughout history. One of the big polluters has been the wood processing industry, and old insecticides that have been banned for decades, like DDT, are still lingering around. The ever-increasing shipping does threaten the very fragile ecosystem of the inner sea. The oil spills are more frequent, where the traffic is busiest. A major oil leak will be disastrous because of the slow exchange of water and the many unique marine species. But the news is not all bad. The sea is expertly monitored and the strict rules govern the industry and shipping, especially in the Scandinavian and western side of the sea. In the east, the rapid economic growth of the former Eastern Bloc countries has brought new challenges. But as the new European Union nations, they'll have to follow suit. And back to wreck diving. Especially the old war wrecks that carried weapons and toxins are a real threat to the sea. So finding and analysing the old wrecks and their cargo and emptying the rusting oil tanks is vital also for the environmental point of view. Despite all of this, the Baltic Sea is considered fairly clean by international standards. But it takes a lot of funding, hard work and cooperation between the countries to keep it so, and hopefully make it better. Finally, the last ferry of this voyage for Tanya and Kimo from Earsberg over the North Sea back to Harwich, England. Since the journey is almost finished, it puts us in a reflective mood. We've learned so much about the Baltic Sea during this adventure, but the more you learn, the more you want to know. 
we hardly visited the Gulf of Finland or the Gulf of Bothnia, the long shallow arms of the sea. Never even set foot in Latvia, Lithuania or Poland. The history is so rich with stories and we only touched on some of the subjects. And there is still 50,000 wrecks in the Baltic Sea, 